Advanced Learning Program with Early Literacy Targeted Interventions. And we have Waterford here to talk with you and answer some questions. And we will also welcome Justin Wilcutt. He is here on behalf of OPI. Um, he's going to talk to you about the AIM and the Infinite Campus uh, information. So Kim, if you'll flip to the next slide. <clears throat> So we have a brief agenda. Uh, first, Kim and I will talk a little bit about some things, then we'll have Waterford, and then we'll uh, finish up with Justin. And um, if you have questions all along, drop them in the chat. We'll try to answer them as we go, but we'll have time at the end to go ahead and help you out. Okay, so just some quick key points. Um, if you're here, you already know about early literacy targeted interventions, and we're just only talking about the home-based program. Um, if you do have questions, we can address them later about other things. But here is sort of the order in which things go. Schools decide to offer a home-based program to eligible students four years old through second grade. Um, you determine eligibility with your own screener. You use an approved one or you assure that you are using one that is research-based and proven with evidence to predict third grade reading proficiency. Then schools request a number of licenses. You do that by filling out the license request form. You probably have all done that. Then schools receive an email from Waterford confirming the number of license you requested. And then uh, you, I'm sorry, you receive an email from Waterford and that confirms the number of licenses and includes a flyer with registration codes. The schools then distribute the flyers to their eligible students, families or guardian, um, hopefully with an explanation of what it's for and um, why it could be used by their family. Um, we've called this meeting because we seem to find ourselves in some muddy waters from this point on. So you can see in red there, we're hoping that Waterford, OPI, and schools can collaborate to support parents in getting their child actually registered and actively using the program. And we'll also just note here, um, we do not wish for you to enter a child into Infinite Campus as using this program unless they are actively using it, not just that you gave them the flyer. And so we'll talk through some of that, but I think Waterford uh, may have some tips and tricks, and we'll let um, either Courtney or, or Becky talk with you next. Again, put your questions in the chat, and we'll just keep moving. Yeah, so hi guys, uh, Becky Eberhardt. You should have all received emails from me this past week. Um, some of you have been emailing back and forth with on Friday and Monday. So you have the um, flyer that was mentioned. It has a unique code for your student. Um, and that code can be used for all students that pre-K through second grade. So there's not a different code for every individual kiddo or for a different age group. That code is for your district. Um, if you have questions or concerns, if a student is registered, if the families fill it out, if we have them active in the program, feel free to reach out back to me and I'm happy to look in the system to see what students are registered who claim those codes from your districts and we can share that information back and forth with you. Um, I think the one thing that we've seen sometimes is helpful is if you know those students who've been identified with that screener, um, engaging maybe with the teacher of the classroom that they're in to see if they can put it in the Friday folder for that kiddo, or if they could email it out to the families. Um, if you need additional language uh, to explain more than what that flyer has on it, I'm happy to help you know, draft that email for families, whatever we can do to get families actively enrolling the kiddos in the program and start using. Once a family has 
registered for the program, a family coach will immediately reach out to them, confirming that they're registered. They will also um, confirm that that laptop and internet will be sent to them if they need that as well. And so there will be follow-up on our part, but we can't reach out to those families until they are actively registered since we don't know who they are. So that's just the really big component is making sure families know about the program and then getting them started. Does anybody have any questions through that process or things that we could help with? Um, everyone should have also in the email that I sent out, you will know how many licenses that you had uh, requested and then how many have been claimed so far. Becky, this is Ron Rick, it's call, um, from Butte. And um, you said that once they register, they'll get a notification, an email or something um, saying that they are, um, mm -hmm active and they can they can begin the program um but i'm hearing that i I'm, i have some parents um or at least one that said that um they have not been accepted have not received anything saying they're they're active in the program um what should i tell a parent that that says that um uh do i have them contact <laughs> you or um is there is there a process? Yep. If you want, feel free to send them my way. Um, I'll put my email in here and uh, we'll work with our enrollment coaches and making sure that we can figure out where that um, problem allied there in the, the crossover. So we will definitely work with that family. Okay, thank you. Yep. Andy, um, I see your question in the chat. So my, my question is, do you want to offer home-based learning program? It says you did secure licenses. If you want to offer that, um, then you need to get the, go ahead. Yeah, we were under the impression that we weren't necessarily offering it. We were waiting for OPI to tell us who, which parents had asked, asked to use that program, that we weren't to necessarily actively recruit for home base. Um, when I spoke to someone, I couldn't tell you who at this point, earlier this year, they said the licenses were available for our students that were currently in our pre-K program and potentially those students that were identified as needing title services. But I guess my question is, if they haven't been screened, Using the appropriate screener, do they then need those? Do we need to screen them for that? Or can we just use them as a title kid then work with our preschool kids who have been screened? Are you offering an early literacy classroom or do you, does your school just have a separate preschool? Just an early lit class, not a separate preschool, the early literacy classroom. So you have screened those children? Yes, but not the older kids. And you're saying uh, K-1-2 as well. Right. If you want to offer them to those older students, you'll have to screen them. Perhaps you already use the screener that will work. Um, I can talk you through that. But yes, you can okay. give those out to your children who have been determined eligible. Okay. Well, um, maybe we'll connect just, later then. Yeah, let's connect. I'll have I'll put you down to give you a call, Andy. Okay. Thank you. Let's see, is there other questions? See that Becky put her email in the chat if you need to get a hold of her. Are there any other questions? Um, anything we can clear up? I want to get to the yellow, the in, entering an infinite campus piece. Right. <laughs> it's on the bottom. We'll, we'll let Justin go because there will probably be a lot of questions yeah. after that. <laughs> Um, let me just see, can you give me clarity on whether or not Ames Web Plus is or isn't approved for current kindergartners? Current kindergartners. So if I could clarify, um, I printed out those, those sheets that tell the tests that are like approved. And, and the top says approved tools for four-year-olds and prior to kindergarten. And we don't use any of those for our incoming kindergartners. But once they're enrolled in kindergarten, we are using Ames Web Plus on kindergarten first and second grade. So, okay. so could, you, you would now be screening kids for the following year? 
if you're screening them to determine eligibility now. Um, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Perfect. That answers yeah. it. Now Thanks. that they're in kindergarten, yes, when you screen for the following year, you can use that. Ames. Excellent. So I couldn't use our current data that we have for those kindergartners and offer them these this option this year. No. Okay. Thank you. And just since um, Andy brought it up, uh, what was the question about? I'm thinking about too many things at one time. Oh, if you have um, children who are eligible for title, that does not necessarily mean that they are eligible for early literacy. Um, right. Can I could, we'll ask a follow up to uh, yes. Alicia's question? So what you're saying is if they if we're if we're not talking kindergartners, but we're talking actually first and second graders that would qualify in Ames Web that we can't use that data or we can't qualify them for this year. I'm I have they, to get they would have been to... kindergartners and first graders last year. Right. And um let let me follow up to make sure I give the right answer on that unless Christy would like to Christy's here. Hi. Hi everybody. Good to see you all this afternoon. Um so it sounds to me I, I'm, I've been listening in, and it sounds to me like there's some questions that uh, you that students, parents didn't request that students were screened in the springtime, and are now potentially requesting that they be screened to participate in an early literacy intervention program. And um, ideally, you know, the screeners were chosen to be the screeners that are appropriate for the spring prior to the year, right? So that schedule you showed, Alicia, is the screeners that the board said, hey, these are the screeners to use. Um, ideally, for just developmental purposes, it's kind of targeting that springtime before the year. But as always, if you have new students, they have that um, opportunity to participate. So you would need to, you know, schools make their eligibility determinations, but you do need to use one of those to um, identified screeners in order to do so. So schools do have some understanding of their eligibility and it does need to be by parent request, but it sounds like you might have some parents who would be interested in having their older students screened for this. So then you would need to use one of those approved screening tools. I hope that helps to answer the question. At this point in the year, you could check for eligibility for, for the home-based program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then in the spring, you'll have the opportunity to um, screen again to look at Jumpstart for those older kids. Hopefully that clarifies. Looks like Brent has a question about some older students as well. Um, FastBridge is an acceptable screener for those older students. So you would be able to use that as a screener for your first and second grade students. I think you, actually, you could uh, actually answer my question um, previously. We're, we're more than likely not going to be able to <clears throat> use those students this year, but potentially next year. Yeah. If you have a first or second grader that were in your school last spring, and parents are concerned and you think they might benefit from Waterford, you could certainly look at those scores from last spring. Again, that won't really help if they are new to your district. Sure, yep, perfect, thank you. Yep. Well, we'll let the man of the hour, Mr. Um, Infinite Campus <laughs> jump on and uh, talk you through this very heavy process. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. I just sent a screen share request. Well, let me do it now. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin uh, Wilcutt. I've been with uh, OPI since May of this year. I, I work in the AIM unit and also with the CTE group. So I get lots of time to get to spend in Infinite Campus. Um, let's see. Can you guys see my screen okay? Looks should be the OPI website. All right. Um, so the first thing I was going to show you is we do have a help guide out here. Um, we're working hard trying to get help guides for all of our stuff out there and up to date and keep them up to date. Uh, this this one for early literacy, we we updated it last week because of some some things we found were being missed. 
Uh, from the OPI website, if you go under leadership, there's the AIM achievement in Montana under data and reporting. And on that, if we scroll down quite a ways under AIM resources, we have this data collection information. Under that, we have user guides, and I can put the link right to this in the in the chat if you'd like. Um, the early literacy programs is the um, the help guide we have for this uh, program. So there's a few different sections. You guys said, okay, I'll make it a little bit bigger. This help guide covers home-based, classroom-based, and but well, I think it's just home-based and classroom-based actually on this one. Uh, the 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 things that we need to do for um, all of these students, one is creating an eligibility record. We're also going to look at creating a new calendar just for home-based early literacy. Um, it's been a little bit tricky figuring out how we can how we can track these, and the the best way we found to do it is to um, create these in a separate calendar. Uh, some of you school, some of you might have been using um, have extracurricular students like uh, homeschooled students that come in for sports or things. And we're we're doing it in very much the same way for tracking the home based early literacy. Can I ask a third... question? Oh, why yeah. we have to create a new calendar, and I can't just go under state programs? Because so uh, under state programs, there's an early literacy record, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the other calendar right now with Infinite Campus, we can't have more than one enrollment in a school. Um, like you can't, so we have to have a set as another enrollment just the way that infinite campus is working right now. We're, we're trying to find a different way to do it. The eligibility record only shows, um, well, I'll, I'll get into what all it, it where, where we track, like why they're eligible for the program. That's um, the part that's under state programs. Yeah. The I filled enrollment. it out for early literacy and I filled it out for jumpstart. Um, mm -hmm. so I know where it's located. I guess I just have a question. We don't receive any funding for home-based right like you guys take care of it all and so to have to create a calendar and to do all that work when like we have multiple like i guess i just don't know why it can't be under their regular enrollment and you just say they're in that program well with, with the way infinite campus has it set up right now and we are working on that that's this is the way that we're told that this is the way we have to track them i wish i had a better answer for you on that um infinite campus when they programmed it for us to be able to track it and to be able to separate it out as the um, difference between a, you know, a, a primary enrollment, uh, a secondary enrollment, um, and, and other types of things, and then having these classroom or home-based enrollments separate, we have to do it in a separate calendar right now. Like I said, I wish I had a better answer because it's, I know that's not, that's it's not a, an, an easy thing. Um, so if that makes sense, sort of. <laughs> I get that that's not it's not an ideal situation to be able to track it that I way. I mean, it doesn't because I can put title services. I can put a kid as ELL. Mm -hmm. I can do all those things and they don't have to have a separate calendar. And, yep, absolutely. And that's why it doesn't make sense to me. I just have to press a button if they're in gifted and talented. I just have to press a button if they're in Title One services. I don't know why I can't just have a little in, under the enrollment tab, a little check mark and well, say, yep, home based program. And there is a there is a checkbox, and I'll get to that in a minute. That's what we got to do. But as of right now, it still has to be in a separate calendar because of the way, um, you know, when we make changes, when we make requests, we have different things to get added. We put a request in with Infinite Campus, the company, to to modify it, and the way that they implemented it requires us to use a separate calendar right now. I know that <laughs> it's not a, it's not a, a, a great answer. And hopefully we're, we're working on getting that fixed so that we can just use the checkbox and have it work that way. But for right now, it it, it, it puts too many things together and it, it, and this is the way we, we have to be able to track it appropriately. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through it and then we can come back to that. If you, if, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm, we're hoping to get a better fix. The idea, the plan was that it would just be the checkbox. Um, but the way it was implemented, that isn't working. Um, so let's see. So for all, uh, every student can, uh, participating in early literacy, um, like Melissa said, you know, whether they're in Jumpstart or the classroom based, um, we need to create the early eligible, or the, uh, yeah, the uh, eligibility records. I have an infinite campus. This is like a test system. Um, that doesn't have any actual real student data in there. So these are all just, I, I don't know where they got it, just made up names on things, just so you don't worry about that. Um, but within that, 
to we, we're we're uh, trying to be consistent about how we're showing it. Um, for those that are using the old look in Infinite Campus, we strongly recommend moving to the new look um, for as as much as you can. Um, the old look is going away uh, next July or so, is what Infinite Campus is telling us. Um, so and, and we we do have some information that could be helpful for that. So and we're also help, happy to help you walk through it. But all of our instructions now are using the the new look. So in the new look under um, student information, state programs, there's an early literacy section. And then typically when you go in here, the first thing it's gonna do is say, you know, you gotta find a student. And so I, I, I had already brought up some students here. This student shows no records to display right now because they don't have an early literacy record. To enter an early literacy record, you can click the new button down here and there's some things that are required. The first thing is, um, what's the day that we're entering it? So today is the, the 12th. When you when you do that, it'll automatically populate the end date out for one year. You know, so we went to 11, 12, 25. The next one is, what is the school year? The school year we have is 24, 25. And then what is the grade that they're in? So again, when you're doing this like next year, um, you know, for the, the 25, 26 school year, if you're entering them in the spring, you would, you would then pick the grade that they're going to be into, whether it's for jumpstart or home-based or classroom-based. Um, in this case, the student is a, a full-time kindergarten student. The next box is, is based on the screening that was done. What are they eligible for? Alphabet knowledge, oral language. And, and you'll also notice, um, this is one that's got quite a few people. I'm going to see if I can go back out of this. If I go straight from school year down to eligibility domain, I get a whole lot of options, right? If I pick my grade, my options are limited. If I if I go and pick the eligibility domain first and pick one like this one that's a first grade one, and then I pick kindergarten in here, it's going to kick everything out or sometimes it'll air out on things. So if you just remember on this one, just to walk through it in order, you'll have less problems. And then picking the the eligibility domain, you can pick multiple ones if you'd like, you know, the, the student potentially could qualify in more than one area. And then selecting the methodology tool. Again, it's based on the, the grade that is picked as to which grade, uh, as to which tools are available. Um, there is an option for other. And when you choose other, it's going to require that you fill in what the other option is. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you have already entered these in and, and that's not new information. Are there any questions about that part? I have a question. Did you change record entry date? Did it used to say screening date? Yep. Okay. It did say because, screen. Because now mine say like if you think about the year eligibility, it says like they got screened on 415. So the end date is 415, 2025. Do I need to go change those to this school year or is the year not matter because they'll be in like early literacy for the whole year like my yeah no i think that should be fine because you you probably entered them whatever day you entered them in the part that matters is what's the school year for because okay. i that's why i was just asking if it used to say screening date because that's what i yeah thought it did. okay yeah that turned into a whole bunch of discussions and it was decided to change it to record entry date okay um for for various reasons but now record entry date so whatever day you're entering it in um, and, and, and I'll throw that to, to, uh, Kimberly and Jackie, if, if they have one that where the end date is in April, is in April, for example, do you, do you want them to go in and change it to pass the end of the school year or something like that? Or is that okay with? I, th I think that's fine because when they start entering their new screening data, it will be a different school year that they're entering that for. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that should be good. Now, one thing I did just popped in my head, I haven't tested, like if I save this one and then in, say we screen in next spring, I'll have to look and see if it'll allow you to have overlapping ones or not, or you might need to end that one. I'll, I'll do some testing on that. So, uh, now I saved it. And so now this student does have an early literacy eligibility record. Are there any other questions? Well, I have well, while we're in this part. And I just noticed I'm, I'm this is the testing one, uh, the test site. 
but I'm pretty sure our other one you guys have probably seen where it has like a drop down for selecting your school year. You don't have to select that before you create a new one, but as years go on, you'll be able to filter down based on on that. Let me just make a note on this because we're we're running the next versions test in here. Um, Okay, so all the students have to have an early literacy record in their eligibility record. Um, this document also talks about classroom-based, what, what the rules are, the, the requirements, and then what the infinite campus requirements are right now. And we'll go straight to um, home-based early literacy. Um, so... Let me go on this student. If I go to student information and enrollments, this is where we're going to track these. Ideally, so this is the current enrollment that this fake student has in this fake school, <laughs> South School KF. Um, this uh, under underneath state reporting fields, there's a box for home based early literacy, and I'll get. Uh, more clarity on why we can't just use this. I know that I was told that we can't by my supervisors that just doing this and saving it does not work. Oh, that's what it is because there's a rule in there that says we can't have that the home-based early literacy has to have a service type of S partial and a status indicated they transferred from a home or private school. So that's why we have to have two separate enrollments because um, the validation rules or whatever that are written into here they can't be a primary enrollment. So this student right now has a primary enrollment in South School. And so by checking this box, it's validating it and saying, no, this, this student can't, you can't have a primary enrollment and the start status can't be first time receiving educational services. So um, But if it wasn't because, under enrollment and you put it under other program participation, then that might not be an error. So if you go like you have 21st century, you have gifted and talented, um, mm -hmm. homeless, then it's not an enrollment. So maybe that's something to. Right. And and there's a lot of discussions that have been going on between um, OPI and Infinite Campus about how to get this to work because, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I understand I, the calendar for Jumpstart and I understand the calendar for uh, early literacy because we're counting and we're getting funding, like we don't get funding for this. That's that's the reason why I don't understand why we have to, you know, it's in addition to, it's not in replace of. So Jumpstart is not happening at any other time. Early literacy is, the, is their program, their four-year-old. This is in addition to their enrollment. It's not, yeah. you know, so that, that's why I'm kind of fighting you on this. Yeah, no, no, it's it's all good. No, I appreciate that because um, you know, good, good. These are good questions. You know, um, we're not. My, we don't get any money. We have no money attached to home based learning. Where we do with JumpStart and we do with early literacy. Yeah, so, and with extracurricular as well, right? That's another place we use um, extra calendars. Right, when you do your extra calendar calendars. for sports and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and. Yeah, I'll have to look into that because my assumption is it has to do with the because the, the, I think the thought was there'd be a lot more um, private and homeschool students that would be coming in. And so we would have them not necessarily registered. At, you know, you wouldn't want them registered into your school as that because you wouldn't be getting um, A and B and different. You know, you wouldn't be getting money for that. So having a homeschooled student registered or enrolled in your in your school. And they'd have to have an enrollment in order to use one of the other things like gifted and talented is. Um, my assumption is it's around something like that, but I'll do some more asking and, and digging on that and find out why. But um, my assumption is it has to do with the, the home and private school crossover. I mean, for my elementary school, I already have one, two, three, four, five, six calendars right now. So you're adding like a seventh calendar and that's all to do with funding, right? Like I have to have a separate kindergarten one and I have to have it first through third and it's all because of hours and I mean it's just a lot of calendars <laughs> so that's not a cal oh so yeah you have different period schedules for kindergarten yeah we have different because you have different hours and then you have you know and then I have jump start program and so it's yeah. another calendar yeah so I'm gonna write your name down Melissa and I'm, okay. I'm gonna talk to you separately on this 
but we'll continue on through then with what we have what we have the way it's set up right now how we're doing it um but i do want to talk to you more about this um so so this student so let me uncheck that one because it won't let me save it anyways um so uh so in the instructions, it tells us, you know, it talks about there, there's two things that I want to point out here. One is this home-based early literacy, which will create the enrollment in the new calendar. And the other thing is, and, and again, this is the way it is set up at the moment, working on getting it changed. But for all students, regardless of whether they're public school, private school, homeschool, whatever, the start status on that enrollment is transfer from homeschool within the state is what we want everybody to set it to, to keep it simple right now until we can get that fixed. Um, so those are the two things that, um, you know, we that um, are a little bit odd with these. Um, who wants to learn how to create a new calendar? I don't Does see any hands up yet. know that? <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll walk through this one here real quick. So I think... The cell school that I created a calendar in here. I created a calendar in there. I'm going to go to oh, West School. Do we have a, we don't have a, so West School doesn't have a home based calendar yet. So to walk through, uh, oops, to creating a calendar, we're going to go to scheduling and courses, calendar wizard. Create a new blank calendar. And then really all we need to add on here is a start and end date. And that's just going to be the fiscal year. So in this case, it's going to be July 1st through June 30th of next year. And then make sure our year is correct. And then whatever school we're going to create it in. And if Evergreen's doing it, they're going to have their seventh calendar to create in there. And then we hit the run wizard button. And then when that runs, um, it'll say it's complete. And right now, if you look and see... There's not an extra calendar in here. And this is just kind of a weird thing to know about how it works. If we refresh our whole browser window, or if we log out and back in, now West is gonna have this new calendar that's added, okay? So we have this West School One, a real original name that we added in there. So we'll go to our calendar information button. And I know this is a lot and I'm going probably kind of fast on this, um, the, the instructions, the help guide should walk you through it, and we're available to help anytime as well. So we recommend that you give it a name so that you know it's it's something different, like home-based. Set the instructional type to other, and that's really all we have to change on here. Um, the grade level setup is the next part to change. And I'll bring my other guide back over just so you can see it. Well, I'm not going to bring that. I'll just show you. So the first thing we do is we add in the different grades. And the first one we're going to add in is pre-K, zero, and oops. And that one's, and then select the, so we just, these are the three boxes that we have to fill in. Pre-K, sequence number zero, pre, and then pre-kindergarten for the state code. The next one is going to be kindergarten, sequence one. And what we're adding in here are the grade levels that are eligible for um, the grade levels that are eligible for the home-based early literacy. Zero one, sequence number two. And then zero two, sequence number three. So what we end up with is pre-K through second grade in the calendar. And the sequence numbers don't quite line up because we have two that aren't numbered. So pre-K is zero, kindergarten is one, one is this, the next one, if that makes sense. Any questions so far? So- I'm no, sorry, I didn't question. have a question. Okay, we um, got Kathy. So I take care of six elementary schools. And um, my question is, do you, so our, our early literacy kids in the PK class are fine, but anybody who's using the home-based 
whether they're homeschool or they're 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 in our school, do they can you put them all into the same calendar, no matter what school they go to? That's my question. So the 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 did you say the home like the homeschool kids? No, well, like the or, kids that for that did jump start this summer. Yeah. Um, that are in kindergarten and first grade. So now they're in their home elementary school. They're enrolled there. Do they mm -hmm. have to be enrolled in this calendar? And can there be just one calendar where I enroll them all, or do I have to have one for every school? Well, the the issue will come in if when you go to enroll them, um, if, if there are, if you enroll them. So if I enroll a kid into the, so I have this calendar created. But if I wanted to enroll a kid that's not um, at that school, you'd have to add them using the student locator wizard, which I, I think that that would work. So I'm talking not quite in procedurally or not quite a, you know as far as the program goes. Um, but if you enrolled them, if you created a calendar in each school, then they would be there and you could just add them add enrollments for them. So there'd be a difference in how you would want to do it, you know, from a technical aspect. Um, Jackie or Kimberly, do you guys, would you guys, would it matter to you if they had them enrolled into one calendar for the whole district or into individual calendars? I already have like 16 elementary calendars. Yeah. Justin, I think if it, if it can work to just have the one calendar and then just put them all in. I mean, for reporting, from a reporting stance, we just want to be able to locate which which um, district the student is yeah, tied to, sense. right? And And be able to track if they're working in the program or not. But I think we would still have access to that data. Yeah, because you're not having to tie them to any teachers or anything like that. So I think mm -hmm. it would make sense if, you know, if you guys could just have one. Okay, so it would be kind of like the um, the activities calendar for homeschool kids. You could yep. put them all under one school. Yep. Okay, thank you. That that just won't work for a classroom-based program, just so we're clear, everybody on here. They have to be attached to their school, not their district. Yep, because classroom based, you're tying it to teachers and, and there's a bunch of other requirements associated with that. So just for the home based early literacy, if, if you have a district where you just want to create one calendar, you can create one calendar and then enroll all those students in to that one. Thanks. Um, so again, I'll just point this out again, because this this gets people sometimes, you know, when I go to look at my calendars, it still says West School one in there and doesn't have that. If I refresh my whole browser. Now it renames it to West School Home Based. This is just an infinite campus. It doesn't automatically update that. So one way to add uh, students to these calendars um, right now, as you see, I don't have any students in this one in, that are enrolled in, in this calendar. If I was to go to West School and I'm just going to go to the regular West School calendar. So this would be a case where um, these are students that are at the same school where I'm creating the calendar, the home based calendar, right? I could take Hunter Anderson, for example. Um, wait for the little green bubbles to come by. Go to the enrollments tab or I guess that's a tab. Right now, this student has a primary enrollment as a second grader at West School. So from here, I could do this is one way to do this would be to do a new enrollment. But instead of enrolling in West, I'm going to enroll in West home based. Student is still a second grader. And start date. I'll say they just started the day just for fun. So we pick the start date, whatever date they started in the, you know, that you have them for the home based program. The service type, we change to S, which is partial. And we change this to 09, transfer from homeschool within the state. And then check this box for home-based early literacy. So when I save that, now it should save that record. So now this student shows two enrollments, a primary and a partial. And now if I go back to the home-based calendar, save it, and do a search, now I have one student enrolled in there, right? So if you're going to enroll, if you're going to create the calendar in the same school that your other student, that the student's already in, 
that's one way to go through and add them is just through just add an enrollment. Any questions on that? So the next way, because so if I was going to go to uh, South School, for example, and I'm going to just, we'll just pick South School here. Do a search for students. So this student here, if I wanted to enroll this one now into the West School, uh, home-based early literacy, if I do a new, well, I guess it, it will let you do that. So you can still do it that way. Go to the West School home-based, kindergarten today, 09. So that probably still would be the easiest way to do it. If you had a homeschool student or something like that, you could do it through the student locator wizard, just like you would um, any other student, and then check the box. So now I should have in the West School, home based, I should have two students now that show up in there. And each of them has a primary um, enrollment. This one's in West and a, and a partial enrollment in the home-based. Primary enrollment here and a partial enrollment in here. Does that make sense? Any questions on that one? I just have a quick question. I'm a Title I teacher and that's how I got roped into this. But all of this end looks more like what our secretary is more familiar with. Do you recommend I get comfortable with this? Or do you recommend I direct her to the OPI directions and just tell her what students when we get to that point? Yeah, in a lot of cases, it's a secretary or a clerk or someone like that who does the entry on it. Um at a lot of schools. I think it, it depends, just depends on how your, your workflow works because you still have to get them the information, you get them the early literacy, the eligibility records, all of that information so that they have the ability to do that. Um, you know, and if they're, you know, they can come and ask you if they get stuck on, on where to enter it. Um, okay. if, if entering things like this isn't normally part of what you do, uh, it might make sense to have someone else do that. Unless you okay. really got excited about seeing this and really want to learn how to do all this. Uh, I already feel like I'm drowning, so. <laughs> okay. I know that, yeah, there's a lot there, um, but I'm happy to help, and you can give me give me a call. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what else? I'm just looking to see. Do we have any any other questions in the chat come through that were anything? Nothing in the chat, Justin. Um <laughs> We appreciate you helping us out. Just so everybody knows, Justin has uh, really worked hard on this and gone to bat with um, those who build Infinite Campus. And uh, we've had a lot of conversations. And obviously, like he said, he is still working on them to get things a certain way. Uh, thank you guys for coming. If you have questions about anything early literacy, now's the time. Um, where we've got about 15 minutes left. So this, this is Ron from Butte and I'm just, um, I'm wondering about the time it takes for, um, for the, the students to complete the program and when we should just, you know, cut that off, um, as far as them having enough time to complete it um so that's my first question and then um, my second question is that there are students now that are learning about the program that are in the head start and some parents um may start asking for screening for those students and i'm feeling like that will overwhelm us for the screening process to get that done. We use the Pelly, and um, that's that's an awful lot to put on our um, reading coaches that have been 
you know, doing that. Um, so yeah, so is there a time we, we just, we just, you know, shut it down um, because there's not enough time for the kids to complete the program. And then about our Head Start. Oh, I guess there is one other one. And that is um, what happens if the student doesn't complete the program in the amount of time? They don't do the, the, the number of hours. And I think that's, you know, for Waterford. I think Courtney can answer how much time they really need and what they truly, how many months they can complete it. And so I'll let Courtney talk, speak to that. Absolutely. Um, so in our experience, um, children experience the greatest learning gains when they get to 1500 minutes, which if you use um, as we uh, suggest family children should, which is 15 minutes a day, five days a week, you can get to 1500 minutes in 13 weeks. Um, so it, uh, we, but we know that like, that is a rigorous um that's a rigorous timeline for families, like the 15 minutes a day, five days a week. So we know that um, children who start using by January can reach the 1500 minutes pretty handily by the end of May. So um, that's one part of your question, Ron. And so then the other part I would say is it's the district's choice to offer the program or not. You can place the perimeters around it for what you are able to support. Um, okay, I just, you know, I, we do have those licenses. I don't want them to go to waste. I don't want them to be taken away. And given this is our first year jumping into it, I think we're doing a pretty good job getting that out to all of our preschool and our jumpstart students. Um, maybe next year, that's what I was thinking is maybe next year we start looking at those pre those Head Start students and figure out a way that we can screen them. Does that screening have to be given by our district? Or if we train somebody at the Head Start program to do that screening, is that going to be acceptable? Um, I, it, it should be somebody from your district, but consider that you may have a a co-op, a special services co-op in your area that could offer that on like a everybody bring your kid in on this date type of thing. Yeah, and, um, and we we did a little bit of that. Um, or or you could do that, that yourself, but that gets the kids all there at one time. You just have to have enough people at your district there that day to get that many kids assessed. Yeah, that's a lot. You know. It is. It, you're you're in Butte, right? Yes. Yeah. So maybe contact um, other, you know, district partners or districts to see if you could hold that countywide, but have enough. Um, I know that I know that the um, the special service co-ops are really interested in helping support this. I just okay. think that. Um, I think you could hit rough waters if you just had somebody at Head Start give the assessment. Okay, thank you. So I was asking, I want to ask about if you can repeat the eligibility, I guess. And I'm thinking of a brand new first grade student we have. She came from out of state and she was homeschooled. And she is significantly behind. I would love for her to participate in this because I do have her in the title group. Would she be eligible this year or no? Because we didn't screen her in the spring. You, you can still assess that child, but it would get it done quickly. And if they are eligible, then you could offer them the water for, yeah. Okay. And like I've already done Ames Web benchmarking because we've done so you know okay yeah okay. so you can use that okay what, whatever your whatever you decide is your cut point on aims web for other kids that you're determining eligibility for absolutely yes and then we cannot do older students say a third grader who's similar was homeschooled his entire career and he's this at 
Yeah, this would not be appropriate for them. I think at that point you might want to start um, your different processes title, you know, possibly, yep. you know, assessing for other things. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Any more questions out there? If not, uh, Kim, do you want to share our um, our contact information? Yep. Yeah. I can share my yeah. screen. Hold on. Get your uh, pencil ready or a camera or a screenshot. We're going to share all of our contact information. And as all, since we have you here, as always, you know, uh, the uh, Reading and Early Literacy website um, through OPI has a wealth of information, our recordings from the learning series we've been doing. Um, if you want to know more about the learning series, you can go in, you can still sign up, you can have your staff join. Uh, we have most of the sessions recorded, um, and especially those with early literacy classrooms, kindergarten and first grade teachers have found this to be very helpful. Um, and we're always happy to have people join. It's uh, become somewhat of a community of practice around uh, early literacy skills. So, And if you are looking for the reporting instructions that Justin was highlighting, we also have those on our website under the reporting tab on the um, reading and early literacy um, webpage. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. How will we know what students have signed up for home base so that we can mark them on our calendar? Your school will receive a usage report from Waterford. Courtney, if you'd like to speak to that, go ahead. Yes, we, um, any district that has um, children who are registered and using the um, using the program, we can send you uh, a report on how much they've used quarterly. Okay, so if we have a student signed up right now, when will I get that information of what student that is then at the end of this quarter? Yes, so uh, in the beginning, at the beginning of December, which... Okay. And that's okay that that doesn't get checked in AIM until then? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. If there are no more questions, um, you can go ahead and just log off. As always, get in touch with Kim or I if you need something. Thanks Thank for coming, everyone. everyone.